Uh, okay. So uh, before uh, Professor uh, Colin Shepard will uh, continue with his presentation about uh, uh, confocal microscopy, uh, I want to uh, ask you about the poster session. Due to the uh, uh, large number of the posters, uh, the evaluators ask you to uh, try to express your uh, paper in 10 minutes to uh, increase the efficiency, okay? So prepare yourself to be ready to tell everything in 10 minutes, then you have additional discussion. Okay, and uh, now I invite Professor Colin Shepard to continue the interesting discussion about confocal microscopy and super resolution, and today will be also the phase contrast microscopy part. So, please, Professor. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so um, in, in the uh, opening talk I gave yesterday, uh, I went a bit slower than I thought I would. So, um, you'll find if, if you look at the, um, uh, the, the talks that have been uploaded, today I've chopped some of the, the slides out, just a, a small number, but uh, you can see those. It's all, all things that I thought that other people would carry would say more about later on the in the course, like Rainer Heinzmann uh, and uh, Alberto Diaspro. Uh, so they're, they're both going to be talking about super resolution aspects. Um, right, now, I, I, what I was going to do now, I introduced confocal microscopy last time. Uh, what I was going to do is to, is, is to actually derive uh, the imaging equation for not a fluorescence microscope, but a coherent uh, a coherent form of a uh, uh, confocal microscope, just so you can see uh, how, how it works. Uh, and uh, so last time I, I introduced the fact that uh, if you've got a coherent imaging system, here it's just a single lens, uh, and you've got some object, this is the object amplitude uh, distribution, uh, then the image you get is the convolution of this with the amplitude point spread function uh, of the lens, right? Which was this thing, 2J1 of V over V, uh, that we, it's the amplitude point spread function. Uh, so now we're in a confocal, uh, and, um, well, here I've drawn it as a transmission system uh, to a first degree... So far, anyway, it doesn't really matter whether it's a, a reflection or a transmission system. Uh, there is a very real difference. I'm not sure whether I shall say much about that or not. But, um, but anyway, in the focal plane, when it's in focus, they're the same. Uh, but I've just drawn it like this so you can you see what's going on. Uh, so um, we, we found what we've got here, the amplitude we have here. Uh, this amplitude is then multiplied by the... So, so, sorry, this is a point source. We get a, uh, the point spread function of the first lens, H1, here. Uh, this is then multiplied by the transmission of the object, which is placed here. Uh, but this is actually shifted, and this XSYS is a scan coordinate. We're moving the, the, the sample relative to this focus spot. Uh, and then this, this is imaged again by a second lens, and we get this H1T uh, convolved with the point spread function of the second lens. Uh, and um, so finally then, of course, we, we, we look at the intensity again. So this is the expression for the final uh, image intensity that you would see uh, in this plane of the detector here. And you see this depends on XD, but also on XS. Uh, and, uh, and what we do in a, uh, in a confocal microscope uh, is we, we, we basically just look at the intensity on the axis. So we put uh, x d y d equal to zero. So if we put x d y d zero, we get this now. And you see that this, uh, th this expression is basically h1, h2 convolved with t. Uh, so you know, this is, um, you might find this rather surprising, the mathematics, the way it works, because here we, we, we've got something which is looking like a H1 convolved with HT, but we end up getting a product. 
Uh, and, uh, and it's this product which is really nice for us because it has the effects of sharpening up the uh, point spread function uh, so we get a better resolution. Uh, and, uh, and it also is responsible for the, uh, the optical sectioning effects as well. Uh, so this confocal microscope in this mode like this uh, behaves as a coherent microscope with an effective point spread function which is given by the products of the point spread functions of the two lenses. Okay, so once we, once we know how to calculate the image, now we can calculate the image of various things. I showed some of these before. This is the image of two points. Uh, you remember uh, I showed these top three plots before uh, for uh, an ordinary micro a conventional microscope with different sizes of condenser aperture. Uh, and um, uh, and then uh, now I'm giving confocal reflection and confocal fluorescence as well. And you see that, um, so this blue one, as I described before, is, is, is uh, pretty close to the Rayleigh uh, separation. Remember we said that uh, here the two points are resolved, here they're certainly not resolved, and this is in confocal reflection, this is in confocal ref uh, fluorescence. You see that the size of this dip gets quite very pronounced, especially in this confocal fluorescence case. Uh, so we can see that uh, the imaging of two points is better in the confocal system. Okay, now I was going to uh, jump back and talk a bit about the history of how confocal uh, microscopes uh, were introduced and so on. Uh, most, uh, usually we, re we recognize that the confocal microscope was invented by Marvin Minsky. Uh, people, some of you might know the name of Marvin Minsky. Unfortunately, uh, he, he uh, died last year, 2016, uh, but he was very famous in the area of artificial intelligence mainly. Uh, so why he came up with uh, this idea is uh, not too clear. Uh, but anyway, this is, uh, these pictures are taken uh, from his uh, patent that he filed in 1957. Uh, and, uh, and you can see, uh, he didn't call it a confocal microscope, by the way. He called it a double-focusing optical system. Right? So stressing the fact that you've got the two lenses. Uh, and you can see a transmission system, a reflection system. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out here uh, is, uh, you know, 1957 was uh, a, a long time ago. And so you, we, there wasn't the same technology then that there was now. So you can see that from these diagrams. You see the, the source of light uh, is some sort of, uh, you know, it's a, a lamp bulb. Uh, this was before the laser was invented. There was no laser in 1957, right? So it brings it into perspective. Uh, and you can also see uh, the uh, photo detector is just a simple photocell. Uh, so um, I, actually, I think the photomultiplier might just have been a, about invented by them, but uh, it was only in its infancy. Uh, and the third thing, uh, well, you wouldn't see this in the diagram either, anyway, but uh, the third thing that... Um, Marvin Minsky didn't have, there was no computer, right? So, uh, and I'll say more about that in a minute. Uh, so that was 1957, uh, but actually, it turns out that the, the concepts of confocal imaging uh, had been discussed before. Uh, I'm not trying to belittle what Marvin Minsky did because I think he was, his was the first real confocal microscope. Uh, but um, I'm going to show you two examples of earlier things. Uh, this one was from Goldman in 1940. Uh, and uh, so this system, uh, this is an image taken from his system. Um, it's a, uh, you see, this is for looking at the eye. Uh, and uh, this image is actually a... Um, a section through the eye is what in, in confocal we call an XZ image. Uh, in, and um, in, uh, in OCT, they call it, uh, uh, what do they call it? Anyone remember what this called? A, a Y scan or something? But anyway, but they, everyone calls these things different things, different areas. Uh, but, um, but, you know, this, 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 to me, this is an amazing image uh, that, where you can see the cornea and the lens of the eye. 
Uh, I think that um, if you showed this to most people working in the OCT area nowadays, they think this was done with OCT. Uh, but it's not. It's done with this, this system, which is basically a sort of confocal system. Um, but it's actually um, what we sometimes now call semi-confocal, uh, because instead of using a pinhole, it uses a slit. Uh, and so what we do is uh, we illuminate the sample with actually a line of light, or actually a sheet of light. So this is actually really also uh, um, what's now called the um, SPIM, the Selective Plane Illumination Microscope, or a, a sheet, or a light sheet microscope. They all become the same in the end. Uh, so you illuminate with this sheet of light, or, or, or effectively a line of light, which is um, where it cuts the, the, uh, the, the um, focal plane. Uh, and then uh, this line is imaged onto a slit here. And the slit acts like the confocal pinhole and does the optical sectioning in the same way as the pinhole. Not quite so efficiently, and I'll show some example of that later on, but um, it's not as good. But the big advantage is you're imaging a whole line at a time, right? The, the big disadvantage of, of the confocal microscope with a pinhole is that we have to look at every point, one after the other. So it takes some time to do that. Uh, if you do it this way, with a line of light and a slit, uh, you get a whole image uh, at, at, uh, at one time. Uh, but you've still got this problem. How do you record this? Again, before computers, uh, before CCDs or anything like that. Uh, so actually, he writes this, this image onto, onto film. Uh, and the film rotates under this slit. So we write, we, we, we write out the image, this XZ image, onto the, onto the film as we scan uh, in the, the Z direction. Um, so, the, so that's a very, uh, to me, a very nice uh, uh, paper that describes this. It does actually give a lot of details. It's not really, the paper's not really about the instrument. Uh, most of the paper is about the, the medicine. You know, it's lots of pictures of diseased eyes and all sorts of things in this paper. Um, but it does have another, another interesting feature. I think, I'm not sure whether this, this was the first place this really came up, uh, but, um, but it's, um, you'll notice another aspect of this system, and that is that we illuminate along this line uh, and uh, we detect along this axis. Right, so the two axes, the illumination and the detection, are, are separated. Uh, they're at 45 degrees uh, in this case. Uh, and um, um, what this does, this also helps with the optical sectioning. Uh, because it means that in order to get an image, of course, you have to both illuminate and you also have to detect. Uh, so this means that, you know, you're illuminating along this axis, you're detecting along this axis, so you will only pick up a signal where these two axes cross. Right? So as well as this confocal or semi-confocal optical sectioning, we also get another optical sectioning uh, property which arises from this offset arrangement. Um, so this offset arrangement, I guess, uh, well, it really dates back to the original ultra microscope that was uh, developed um, in about 1910. Uh, so it is a very old, old idea, uh, but it's the basic principle of the slit lamp that the, uh, the optometrist will use to look at your eye. Okay, so that was Goldman. Uh, the other one I wanted to show was this one from 1942. This is a Japanese paper in Japanese by Koana. Uh, and uh, you can see from these diagrams the similarity with the previous ones I've shown. Um, th th this is the, uh, the pinhole. Uh, so this is also a confocal system. Uh, but it was, it was, it was a confocal uh, microphotometer system. What he wanted to do was to measure accurately uh, the, uh, the, the, the strength of this light. Uh, and he realized uh, that if he, if he put this um, pinhole here, he could get rid of stray light. Just like I was described, uh, the confocal pinhole gets rid of this stray light. Um, but, uh, but it didn't seem, as 
from what I understand, this paper doesn't really describe a complete microscope where we're scanning and actually produce an image. It's just looking at isolated points and making measurements. So 1942, Koana. Um, now, so now I'm going to um, jump to a bit later than Minsky uh, to uh, uh, some uh, papers by um, uh, Pat uh, was um, or is uh, from Czechoslovakia. I met him. Uh, I saw him just last year, so he's still active. Although he must be get he's old, older even than me. Uh, and, and anyway, so this is his system. What he realized uh, was that um, another way of getting around this problem of the speed, you know, in a confocal microscope, you illuminate one point at a time. It's very slow. So why don't we multiplex? Why don't we illuminate lots of points all at a time? I have lots of pinholes and get an image much quicker. Uh, so that's what he did. Uh, so the illumination spots uh, are arranged as holes here uh, on a disk which spins around, and this same disk is used uh, as the confocal pinhole on the way out, so the light comes in, it goes to the sample, it goes back through the disk, and you see here is an eyepiece. Uh, so you actually, you actually see a confocal image with this system, with your eye. There's, you don't need a computer to store it or anything like that. Uh, so a uh, very nice system uh, that uh, was... Um, actually originally commercialized by Petran himself, but now there are a few companies that, that make these systems. Right, now, I, so I got into confocal microscopes uh, when I was at Oxford. I, I moved to Oxford in 1974 uh, from Cambridge, and um, we started building this confocal microscope. And uh, so this was... Um, this, this was actually our first laser scanning microscope. I, um, you can see uh, quite a simple thing, really. It's just a helium neon laser, uh, two objective lenses. This is a transmission system. Uh, we used a photodiode on this first one as a detector. Uh, and the sample was actually mechanically scanned through the focal spot. Uh, and and to, the, to this day, a lot of people still use this stage scanning uh, is particularly good if you want to make some accurate measurements because it means that the optical system is completely unchanging as you scan, right? If you use Galvo mirrors, uh, you never know what's going to happen. Um, so that was uh, our system. Um, this, is the, this, this is actually the very first image we got with this system in 1975. It's a test chart, uh, and, uh, and you can see... Uh, you see that it looks like a, an old-fashioned television, and that, that's because it was an old-fashioned television. That's how, how we used to display the image, and then we photograph from the television. Um, we were actually also developing a, a beam scanning system uh, in the same year, and this, this is an example of that. Uh, so so these, the, these pictures are all taken from this article. It's in the um, uh, Journal of the Royal Microscopical Society. Uh, and uh, it gives a sort of history of, of um, our early work on confocal. Um, I, I wrote this article, actually, when I left Oxford to go to Australia, summing up things. Right, so, um, oh, what happened? Ah. An, an update to Adobe Flash Player is... Um... <laughs> Perhaps I uh, should, should have turned off the wireless. Uh, right. I, oh. oh, it seems... Oh, no. Yeah. Okay. So, um, th uh, th this is me when I was younger. Uh, and uh, so, so with the other members of our group, uh, now, so uh, our group, our professor was Rudy Kompfner, uh, who, uh, who was famous for inventing the traveling wave tube, amongst other things. Uh, and uh, so he was the guy who started this work. Uh, and uh, so with us here um, were two, uh, two students. This is uh, Amar Chowdhury uh, from India. 
so he was the, the first PhD student to work on our confocal microscope project. Uh, and, uh, and here you can see, actually, we had this paper, it's 1977, uh, image formation in the scanning microscope, where, where we derived the, uh, the imaging performance of the, of the confocal. And, and as I say here, this was actually the first paper that, that I believe ever used this term, confocal microscope. Uh, the other guy, Peter Hale here, he was working on a completely different project, which was to do with optical fibers, which was another thing we were working on those, those days. Uh, and, uh, and, the, the, and the remaining person of the group, you can't see because he was taking the photograph. Uh, and that was Julian Ganaway, uh, who I'll, I'll show something about him in a minute. Um, so, so um, yeah, a lot of the stuff we did uh, when I was in Oxford, was in confocal reflectance, not fluorescence. Uh, and uh, well, part of the reason for that was it's much cheaper uh, because you don't need much of a laser. Uh, whereas confocal fluorescence, remember, uh, th this was actually before the days of air-cooled argon lasers. So you had to have a gas, uh, you had to have a water-cooled laser if you had a, an argon laser in those days. Uh, and um, uh, but anyway, these are all, uh, these are all confocal reflectance images uh, and um, all taken from the time when I was in Oxford. So this is a stereo pair of a pollen grain. Uh, if you cross your eyes, some people can make that fuse to produce a nice 3D image. Uh, this is a, a color confocal image. Um, it's basically, it's, this is not pseudo color. This is taken using three lasers uh, three pinholes, uh, and, and uh, you have to, of course, align all that. So you have to get a research student, lock him in a lab for a week, and eventually he can get it all lined up. Uh, and, uh, but th this shows, um, you see, it's, uh, it's, it's actually in, inside, um, it's imaging under the surface of a leaf. Uh, so normally, if you put a, a leaf in an ordinary microscope, all you see re is reflection from the surface. Right? And, uh, and these green things are chloroplasts. Uh, so this is the, in, in, the internal structure of the leaf in its real color. Uh, this is some, uh, a brain sample, all, all these neurons. Uh, oh, this is another interesting one. This is a, 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 a cell that's just dividing in the process of dividing. Uh, and these are microtubules uh, that have been labeled uh, with gold nanoparticles. Uh, so, um, so 15 nanometer gold nanoparticles. Uh, so this is quite a long time ago, um, around uh, the late 80s we were doing these experiments. Uh, we went right down to actually um, 5 nanometer gold nanoparticles. So they were conjugated to, uh, in this case, to microtubules. Um, I might add, of course, nanoparticles have got the great advantage over fluorescent probes that they don't bleach. Uh, so you can look at them uh, forever. Right, now, uh, so I mentioned that our first system didn't have a computer. Uh, eventually, we did get a computer. Uh, and uh, so this, um, I met, mentioned uh, this student last time, Ingemar Cox. Uh, he was a student, he was actually a graduate in computer science. Uh, and his PhD project was to... Uh, hook up a, a, a computer with our microscope. Uh, and so these are some of his results. Uh, so this, th this paper in 1983 describes, I think, think this is the first confocal microscope with a computer. Uh, and um, so showing how you can get optical sectioning and all these things. Um, now another thing that happened when I was in Oxford was, was uh, we were involved with commercializing this system. Uh, and um, so in 1982, we set up a company called Oxford Optoelectronics uh, that was uh, our, really the main uh, market we were looking for was the semiconductor uh, materials type market. Uh, and uh, so uh, this, this um, uh, microscope was developed. Uh, we later sold on the rights uh, to another company, and it became this Laser Sharp, 1984. Uh, eventually, Laser Sharp was bought by Byrad. Uh, and uh, in 1987, 
uh, Biorad brought out uh, the, the, this um, MRC 500, um, which um, which I have to admit was not our design, right? So this was a this is a, a beam scanning system. Ours was a stage scanning system at that time. Uh, but this 1987 was was when biologists found out about um, confocal, really, uh, and it was all because of these adverts like this one, which show um, fruit fly chromosomes. So this is um, uh, with and without the pinhole, and you see how much better it looks in the confocal image. So that's when it all started. Um, now I'm going to carry on. This is, this, this is now in, in, uh, in my Australian days. Uh, so I was at University of Sydney uh, in physics department uh, for 15 years. Uh, and uh, so this was a paper that was published. Uh, Min, Gu was, Min, Min Gu was my postdoc uh, when I was in uh, Sydney uh, before he went off and did things on his own. Uh, and this was a paper... Uh, which was about um, penetration into scattering medium uh, and, and trying to show how you get improved penetration into a scattering medium using the confocal effect. Uh, and uh, so what you have to do is optimize the size of the pinhole and so on. Uh, and uh, you can read more about that in this old optics letters paper. Um, uh, the student who did this, Tony Tanous, uh, was from Lebanon. Uh, and uh, he went back to Lebanon afterwards, and uh, in fact, I got in touch with him for the first time for a very long time, just last year. So he's still uh, active. Okay, right, so I think I've um, put over the impression that the confo confocal microscope is great, it does a lot of good for you, and uh, certainly that must, must be true, otherwise they wouldn't have sold uh, tens of thousands of these, but um, it still does have some limitations, and I've listed these in some detail here. Uh, I'm not going to go all through this, but you see it's not fast enough, it's too big, it costs too much, and so on and so on. There, there's the, the other problem is resolution uh, and, and how to improve the penetration. Uh, I've said a bit about the speed already. The fact that you know, this, it's slow because uh, we're illuminating one spot at a time, uh, so how, how do you get around that? You can either use the spinning disk, line illumination, uh, or um, structured illumination. So these are some of the ways around that. Um, of course, nowadays, we've got all these super resolution techniques like STED and localization microscopy. I'm not really going to say very much about those because Rainer Heinzmann and Alberto Diaspora can say something about that. Right, now, so what other... Uh, methods are there in order that you can use to get 3D images? Um, well, there, you can do uh, just purely digital type met methods, digital deconvolution. Uh, in the early 90s, they, 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 um, there were a, a number of companies making systems that they effectively called, I, I think one of the companies used as their trade name, digital confocal. So by, by deconvolution, you can get something similar to confocal. Um, I think probably not as good because eventually confocal won and the digital deep convolution really went away. Um, um, then, uh, then there's um, things like OCT that I'm, I'm sure you know about, but there's an, another type of microscope called a coherence probe microscope, sometimes called full field OCT. This is another way of getting 3D images. Uh, then there's multi-photon. We had an introduction to two-photon absorption yesterday from Nicoletta, uh, and I'm going to say quite a lot more about that in a minute. So this leads to, especially to two-photon fluorescence microscope and second harmonic generation microscope. Uh, and then uh, structured illumination uh, is another method. So I'll start, I'll say something first of all about structured illumination. Um, Really, this was first introduced by Lou Koch, uh, again, a long time ago, 1963. It's very difficult to have a new idea because all these smart guys back then uh, invented everything you can possibly think of. Uh, so, um, uh, so Lou Koch's idea uh, was that um, you would actually uh, project some sort of fringe pattern onto your sample uh, and 
So, so your sample is illuminated with a pattern of fringes. Uh, so certainly not Kerner illumination, where you're trying to get very uniform illumination. In fact, the opposite. You're trying to get a lot of structure on the illumination. Uh, and, uh, and this has the effect of basically shifting the, the spatial frequencies. It's like a moiré effect that takes the high spatial frequencies and shifts them to low spatial frequencies. Uh, and then you transmit the low spatial frequencies through the microscope, and then you've got to put them back where they came from, which you do by using another grating. So th th this was uh, Lukosz's idea. Nowadays, uh, this, this second step, the, the uh, reconstruction stage, uh, we don't do optically normally. We would do that digitally. So in a, in a, a normal structural illumination microscope now, uh, you wouldn't have this second grating, just the first one. And, and this one is, a, uh, in Lukosz's paper, uh, this is a bright field system. It's not a fluorescent system. Uh, although he does, you see, he's got, I've, I've actually put this, uh, the, the method may be used with coherent, partially coherent, or incoherent illumination. So I think he was uh, of the opinion you could do this with fluorescence as well. Okay, now I've mentioned confocal with a pinhole. I've mentioned using uh, a, a slit instead of a pinhole. And I've mentioned using an array of spots, array of pinholes. Um, you never get anything for, for nothing in this world. So, you know, the fact that they're faster, you're, you, you throw something away. And what you throw away is optical sectioning. Uh, this shows here... Uh, this, 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 um, this curve here is the um, axial response in a confocal microscope. We often measure this. This is a very simple experiment to do. You, you set up a confocal uh, imaging system with a pinhole. It doesn't even need to be a scanning system. You put in as your sample just a plain mirror. Uh, and then you, sh you, you, you scan the mirror through the focus, uh, and the signal will fall off in this way. It would come to a peak when it's in the focal position. So it's a very easy experiment to do that one. Uh, and, uh, but what you find is if you replace the pinhole by a slit, uh, then you find that it gets broader and the side lobes get stronger. Right? So the optical sectioning is not as good. Uh, and this one is for, a, um, for the, um, an array, uh, array of um, pinholes. You see that um, here it, it basically doesn't decay so far. It, 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 it decays, decays a little, and then it plateaus. Um, I mention it here specifically. Uh, in confocal, uh, this optical sectioning decays as 1 over z squared. Uh, with with um, a slit, line illumination and a slit, it decays as 1 over z. Right? And you all remember from mathematics that if you integrate 1 over z uh, from minus infinity to plus infinity, it diverges. Whereas if you integrate 1 over z squared, it doesn't. Right? So the line, il line illumination with a slit is limited to how thick the sample can be for that reason. Uh, right now, I, I also mentioned earlier then from that um, uh, Goldman paper about using this off-axis arrangement. Uh, and um, so one way of implementing that uh, is, is by um, splitting the aperture of your objective into two semicircular regions. Uh, so th um, you see here there's actually a, a, an opaque bit at the center, which has got a width here of 2 little d. Uh, so they're not quite semicircles. So they're sometimes called D-shaped apertures. And the idea is that you uh, illuminate through one, and you detect through the other. Uh, and so now you can see that these two axes are, are not coincident anymore, and we're going to get this additional optical sectioning that comes about from this effect. Uh, and, uh, and this is demonstrated in this, this diagram here, uh, where you can see that um, you get, uh, for, for normal confocal, you get a slope of minus 2, Inverse square law, it goes off as, as, as 1 over z squared, as I described. With, with this system, uh, if, this, if the, uh, the, this, this D is thick enough in order to stop cross-talk between the two apertures, 
uh, we get a slope of minus 3. It goes as 1 over z cubed, right? So we get this improved optical sectioning. Right, now I'm going to go to two photon. Um, so, you know, the basic principle of two photon uh, microscopy uh, is, um, well, Nicoletta mentioned it yesterday, uh, that the um, absorption is proportional to the square of the intensity. And in two photon fluorescence micro microscope, uh, the uh, signal you pick up is also proportional to the square of the illumination intensity. So what that has, it has two effects. Firstly, it sharpens up the point spread function. So you get better resolution. Uh, I, th I, that, that is true. But unfortunately, if you're doing fluorescence, all right, for a, sing for, for a particular dye, you're using a longer wavelength anyway. So you're getting something a bit better than something that's not so good. So overall, you don't get better resolution with two photon uh, microscope um, for the same dye. Uh, but more importantly, perhaps, you get optical sectioning. Uh, because of the squaring of the, of the point spread function, you get optical sectioning. Uh, and, uh, but you don't need a pinhole. So that's very nice. It means you can get a much uh, more efficient system, which you need, of course, because the two photon absorption is quite a weak process anyway. Um, another thing that's important then, uh, yeah, um, the reason why we can get these nonlinear effects is, be is because we're focusing the light to a very concentrated spot with a microscope objective, right? So we can get a very high power density at the focus. Um, so because of this squaring, you see, if you du double the illumination, uh, the uh, focus uh, intensity, you, you're going to four times the, the signal. Right? So you want to compress it as much as possible uh, in space, but also in time. For a given amount of power, if you use a pulse laser, uh, you're, you're going to get more signal than if you don't use a pulse laser. Right, so, um, so we started working on, uh, also on two photon, on nonlinear microscopes, again, when I was in Oxford. And um, we had this paper uh, that um, you see I published with uh, uh, my professor, Rudy Kompfner, uh, in 1978. Uh, where, where we say, it was, I, and I've printed it out here, in, in the scanning optical microscope, nonlinear e interactions are expected to occur um, which, uh, uh, with, between the object and the highly focused beam of light. So using a microscope objective is what allows you to do this. Uh, and, uh, and then we go on to say that nonlinear interactions include generation of some frequencies, Raman scattering, uh, two photon fluorescence, and others. Right, so uh, we suggested that you could do all of these things, um, but actually the, the particular method that we were really working on experimentally at that time was second harmonic generation. Uh, and, uh, and we had a, a paper in the same year, or, yes, 1978, the same year, uh, which shows some images from second harmonic generation from a crystal. Uh, and, uh, and what's more to the point, it demonstrates the optical sectioning, because here you see these different focus positions, completely different images. Um, yeah, so that was uh, multi-photon. Oh, this is just a pretty picture I thought you might like to see. Uh, this is a, um, uh, an example of um, skin, uh, which, which has been uh, labeled with three things. So there's, there's actually a, um, sorry, there's, um, it, the, the, uh, it's labeled with two fluorescent labels, uh, but the blue is actually from second harmonic generation. You get very strong second harmonic generation from collagen, uh, which is uh, in, in skin. Uh, so this was, um, this was from uh, when I was in Australia. Uh, when I was in Australia, as well as being in the, in the School of Physics, uh, I was also with the uh, Australian Key Center for Microscopy. Uh, and uh, so this work was done as part of that Center for Microscopy. Oh, this is another one I like. Uh, this is uh, second harmonic and third harmonic uh, pictures of my own arm. 
these were taken at the, uh, uh, the National Taiwan University Hospital in Taiwan then. Uh, and this is a series of pictures starting from the top uh, and, go and focusing down into the skin. Uh, the green, uh, you see, is, uh, is second harmonic generation from collagen. Uh, and the, and the um, uh, purpley color is third harmonic generation. There are no, there's no collagen in the outer layer of the skin. Uh, yeah, so um, this is oh yeah, this is showing uh, OTF for confocal fluorescence microscope. Uh, and um, so Ingemar Cox again in this paper here uh, we calculated the OTF uh, and basically OTF for confocal fluorescence is the, the, the uh, spatial frequency bandwidth is doubled as compared with an ordinary fluorescence microscope. Uh, but uh, you see that the response you get out here is like seriously weak. It's increased from two to four, but in this band between three and four, there's virtually nothing. Uh, and then also, um, if you, and this is true, th 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 these curves apply when you've got a very, very small pinhole. In practice, if you're doing fluorescence, you have to make the pinhole a, a bit bigger normally because otherwise you don't get enough signal. Uh, and uh, so if you do that, you find uh, that, the, again, the, um, the, the, the OTF drops off uh, until eventually, if it becomes a very big pinhole, it's almost the same as if you didn't have a pinhole. Right? So, um, so what this is pointing out is that although, as I've described, in principle, confocal microscope can give an improved resolution, in practice especially for fluorescence, uh, where you're looking at very weak signals, in practice you don't get, you don't see this resolution improvement. And uh, I'll go on to say about how you can get around that in a minute. Right, now I'm going to say something about super resolution. Um, so, uh, yeah, so according to what you might call classical theory, uh, the resolution of a microscope, the, the, the transfer function, the OTF or whatever, is band limited and you can't change that. Um, but it was Teraldo de Francia in 1952 who probably first put out the view that resolution itself is not the fundamental limit. The, the fundamental limit is more to do with the information that you can transmit through the optical system. Uh, and um, so, uh, so around the, the 1960s, uh, Lou Koch came up with, uh, I mentioned him earlier, he had several papers about super resolution uh, and, uh, and how you could, um, so the, the structured illumination was one of the methods, but he also proposed some other methods as well, uh, where you, you basically, as I say here, increase the bandwidth by using different polarizations, different wavelengths, i.e. different colors, things like that. Um, then, uh, my student, Ingemar Cox, we worked on a, a, a theory of super resolution, uh, which um, really carried on from the work of Lukosz, uh, but included the effects of noise. Uh, so it included both this idea of information uh, content, information capacity, but also included uh, the, the Shannon-type noise uh, uh, um, and, and we came up with this expression for the information capacity that you can transmit through an optical system. Uh, and uh, so this is the, um, basically the bandwidth in a d direction uh, times the size of the object in, the, in that direction. So what this, is, what this expression is really saying is if you want to improve the resolution to get super resolution, you have to trade off something else. So you can trade off signal-to-noise ratio, time, color, polarization, or whatever, right? So uh, the system can only transmit so much information. It's just a case of how you use that information. Um, so um, as a result of that, I, I this led me to come up with this sort of classification of different um, super-resolution schemes. 
into different degrees of super resolution. And I've la labeled them here uh, as, you see, class 1A is the, is the top one. Class 3 is the lowest one. Class 3, I wouldn't really call this super resolution. Th this includes things like super resolving filters, um, what are now often called super oscillations. These are, these are methods where you improve the two-point response, but you don't improve the bandwidth of the system. Uh, then uh, class two are, one, uh, are methods where you, you do increase the cutoff of the system, uh, but you, you, you're still limited by the maximum numerical aperture of a lens. So the methods of, of Lukosz would usually come into this category. Uh, then class 1b are ones where, where you do indeed in, increase the cutoff of the system, but only by maybe a factor of two, up to a factor of two. And these include structured illumination, confocal, um, and some other methods that I'm going to describe in a minute. Uh, and then these are the ones that, um, well, STED, of course, and uh, STED and localization microscopy are the ones that got the Nobel Prize. It's 2015, wasn't it, I think now? Um, th these, these ones, uh, the, effectively, the, the numerical aperture, the effective numerical aperture is unlimited. You can make it as big as you like. But um, if, what I wanted to, to, to point out here is that you can actually do pretty well using structured illumination or confocal. I like to think of confocal as being an example of structured illumination, right? Structured illumination is a very general term, uh, which means uh, you project some pattern onto the sample. In confocal, we're using the special case of, present, of projecting a spot, a single spot. Um, now, what, this is what it does uh, to, the, to the transfer function. Uh, and uh, so I start with this one. And this is showing, actually, the 3D transfer function. I haven't said anything about 3D imaging. Uh, but uh, until now, uh, but this is what happens. In a coherent system, uh, the, the, the spatial frequencies you can pick up uh, lie on the surface of this uh, cap of a sphere in spatial frequency space. Uh, for an incoherent system, uh, then you have to do the auto uh, correlation of this and you end up with this thing. Um, the, the, the transverse spatial frequency bandwidth is doubled. Uh, we get a fill-in of the 3D spatial frequencies, which means we can get a better uh, 3D image. Uh, but we're, we're still left with this missing, what, what's called the missing cone of spatial frequencies that you can't pick up with this. Um, in a, a confocal or structured illumination microscope, you have to do, the, again, the... Um, uh, well, you do, you do the convolution of the illumination and the, and the detection uh, responses, and you end up with this shape. So now the, now the, uh, the cutoff is doubled again. So this, this, this is four times the size of this. Uh, this is four times the width of this. Uh, and um, and in, pr in principle, uh, if you could illuminate from different directions... Uh, which you can do, for example, using 4pi microscope, you could actually recover uh, all the spatial frequencies within a sphere this sort of size. Uh, so you can see that using effectively semi-classical type methods, there's, there's no um, you know, blinking dots or anything like this here. This is just pure optics. Uh, we've improved things uh, from this... Uh, um, cap of a sphere uh, to this complete sphere of spatial frequencies. So you can see there's a, a huge improvement without going to any uh, fancy techniques like STED or whatever. Okay, now I'm going to um, say something about a couple of things, uh, improvements to confocal that um, I've been working on over the last few years. The first was um, something we, we worked on when I was in uh, Singapore, and this is still carrying on. Uh, it's a technique called focal modulation microscope. Uh, and uh, so the idea is uh, we're trying to improve the optical sectioning. Uh, and what we found is that um, 
what we do is we get our laser and we divide the uh, beam of light from the laser into two parts. We frequency shift one relative to the other using some sort of modulator. Uh, and then we put these two beams separately into the microscope so they don't overlap. Uh, so just like the, uh, the D-shaped apertures that I was mentioning earlier, again, we've got a different axes here. Uh, but it's not now for the illumination and the detection. It's for two illumination beams. So you will only get a signal. Um, so what we do, sorry, is we beat these together. Uh, the intensity um, excites fluorescence from a sample. Uh, we then detect the fluorescent light, and we look for the beat frequency. So we will only get that beat frequency uh, where these two axes cross. So it improves the optical sectioning of the confocal, basically. So that's the, that's the principle. Um, here it shows it doing it with uh, acousto-optic modulators. You can also use electro-optic modulators or whatever. Uh, and this is an example of this. Uh, this is looking at chicken cartilage. This is a confocal image. Uh, this is at a depth of 280 microns into uh, chicken cartilage. But you see that this image is, beco is becoming blurred because of the background, because the optical sectioning is not re rejecting all of the out-of-focus light. Um, if we uh, do focal modulation microscope, on the other hand, this is the image. And we get rid of this background, and we can go deeper. So here it shows image from, you can't see it very well with the lights on, but th this is 600 microns deep into ch chicken cartilage. Uh, so, um, so that's the one technique I wanted to show. So um, that's still being worked on by Nanguan Chen in uh, National University of Singapore. Uh, and, um, yeah, uh, what we found, uh, um, this was a bit of a surprise when we first realized this, uh, I had a, uh, two students who were calculating the imaging performance of this system. Uh, and uh, so I'll start from the beginning. Uh, this shows the point spread function in 3D from a confocal system. Uh, this is basically the square of, of what you'd get from a single lens, as shown in Born and Wolf. Uh, this shows what you get for a conventional system with D-shaped apertures. Uh, and you see here it's made a lot broader. This is the transverse direction. This is a lot broader than that. This is because with the D-shaped apertures, we're effectively only using half the objective. Right? So it's going to be twice as broad. Uh, but this was with focal modulation microscope. Um, um, you, we find that actually uh, the resolution's even better uh, than in confocal. Uh, so this is um, quite an interest, interesting effect, that as well as getting improved optical sectioning, uh, we also get uh, improved resolution. Uh, and, uh, and this is calculating this, um, um, the, uh, the uh, optical sectioning effects as we go out of focus. Uh, so uh, uh, just like we, um, we, we measure this by what we call integrated intensity, which is the area under the point spread function as you go out of focus. Uh, and uh, so this is showing how uh, focal modulation microscope uh, decays as 1 over z cubed, but better than you get with a confocal. Right, and then uh, the final thing I was going to talk about in this talk is um, um, what sometimes we call pixel reassignment, uh, but this is a method that's uh, related to uh, what's called the, now the name that's been used by some people anyway is image scanning microscopy. Uh, and um, so this is a very neat thing. It all started really, uh, again, back to my student Ingemar Cox. Uh, in uh, 1982, he published this paper uh, where I remember he came to me one day and he said he was building a confocal microscope as part of his PhD. And he said, how do, I, how do I align it? How do I know when it's aligned? Uh, now, people who have actually done this themselves would know uh, that what you do is you align it to get maximum signal, basically. right? So the pinhole is aligned to maximize the signal. However, what he found was that if you misalign the system, 
So here he's moving his pinhole sideways. The point spread function actually gets narrower. This was a very big surprise when we came up with this result. Um, the signal is reduced. These curves have all been normalized. Uh, the signal is reduced, but the point spread function is narrower. Uh, but it, you get bigger side lobes. Eventually, the side lobes become huge. Uh, but an effect that we didn't show in this plot here uh, is that the effective point spread function shifts sideways. Right Now, this is obviously true because if you took the pinhole out altogether, it, it, it it's just behaves like an ordinary microscope. Right? So it, the resolution gets worse. Right? So, and this is because all of these, um, the, the, these responses from these out-of-off-axis points are all move sideways relative to the axis. So this is the principle, is that um, you illuminate with this spot, you detect from this spot, the overall effect is the products of these, the effective point spread function, the products of these, which is this. So you're really imaging this spot, not that spot. So this was, um, or, you, you know, this was uh, one of these moments where you suddenly realize something that is quite important. Um, it means that when you take your image as you're scanning, uh, the, the, the information you get from different points in that detector plane are not referring to the same point of the object. So now we use computers, you can put them all back where they come from and you end up with a better resolution. Um, so this is what you do. So you, th this is, th these are all um, from these displaced points and we shift these all back to where they are and we just integrate up. Uh, and um, so, so this uh, principle was proposed in this paper uh, that I published in 1988, which was the year, uh, year before I moved to Australia, actually. Uh, and uh, so this one shows, this figure shows the, uh, the OTF for this system, what's now called image scanning microscopy, and showing how it boosts up these high spatial frequencies. But plus, you're collecting all the light, right? You're not, there's no pinhole anymore. We're collecting all the light with a detector array, but we're putting all the light back where it should come from. Uh, so we get a much stronger signal as well as getting uh, improved resolution. Uh, so, so I published this in 1988 uh, and forgot all about it. And then eventually it was reinvented by uh, Jörg Enderlein. He published it in um, Physical Review Letters. He did the experiment and showed that you could get this sharpening up of the point spread function using this method. Uh, so um, this has now become uh, a pretty important thing, I think. There's um, a lot of groups around the world working on it, and there's also a commercial system from Zeiss. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and this is how, this is some analysis you can find in this paper in Optics Letters, uh, showing how um, the uh, resolution in, uh, changes as you change the size of the detector array, how the signal, the de detection efficiency increases, and how the peak intensity increases. And this is, this is a, an amazing thing when we first realized this. You see, this peak intensity of, a, of the point spread function goes above one. We're collecting all the light, but then we're squeezing it into a smaller spot. So it gets brighter, the point spread function is brighter than you can get in an ordinary microscope, uh, which uh, seems incredible. Uh, and, uh, and this is showing how uh, the point spread, fu spread function changes as you change the size of that detector array. Uh, this was a more recent paper where we looked at the OTF. Uh, this is the unnormalized OTF. So this is basically the strength of the signal uh, that you actually pick up. So I think this is a, a good way of presenting the results. Uh, and, uh, and this set of curves here, the dashed curves, uh, are for a confocal system with different sizes of pinhole. Uh, and you see that um, it starts off out here, but as the pinhole gets bigger, you, you lose all the signal, eventually it ends up here. Uh, whereas the solid curves 
uh, uh, with this pixel reassignment. Uh, and, uh, and actually, in this case, as the array gets bigger, the resolution actually gets better. Uh, so um, this, this is for a lar very large array, is this outer curve here. So as the array gets bigger, the detector gets bigger, uh, after the pixel reassignment, it gets better altogether, whereas um, with the confocal, it gets worse and worse. Okay, so this is the Zeiss. Uh, it's called the Airy Scan. Uh, and um, so I think they've sold quite a lot of these now, doing very well. Uh, I've got no commercial interest with these guys, uh, although they are ni nice enough to mention my name every now and then in some of their things. Uh, and um, so that's the Zeiss Airy Scan. Uh, and um, yeah, um, just to sum up, I've got a couple of things to sum up. One, one is um, there's a, a lot of co controversy. I think Rainer Heinzmann will might maybe say something about this because I think he agrees with me a bit on this, uh, that a lot of these nonlinear, uh, th th these super resolution methods are based on a nonlinearity. So things like Palm and Storm and Stead, are all, th there is always some sort of nonlinearity. Uh, and um, the fact that you can get an improvement in resolution from, from nonlinearity has been known for a very long time. In, for example, uh, lithography is a very good example where we've known that for a very long time. Okay, so um, one of the conclusions I want you to make from there is that, is that uh, you should distinguish between true super resolution and other methods. Uh, and um, uh, and this is just listing some of the things. I'm, I, maybe I've said enough, really, on this. So uh, I think that's the last one on this talk. Any questions before I carry on to say something about phase contrast? Uh, yeah. Thank you, sir, for the nice presentation. Uh, according uh, lead to the uh, structured elimination, I wanted to ask if this structured elimination means a structuring the intensity, not the face. I mean, sometimes we can structure it like tachography. I don't know if you heard about it. Yeah, I know about it. They structured a k-vector direction. And um, so, uh, given the resolution, we can say that tachography has the same limit as any other uh, structured light illumination technique, or it can uh, go further. Yeah, I think they have the same limits. Yeah, I think basically tychography, um, you know, the, uh, when you're doing this structured illumination, you're, you're, the, the, the structuring is done by a lens, basically, right? Sure. Which has got a fixed aperture. And you can't beat, uh, you know, a, yeah, a, a, a complete hemisphere or whatever with a lens. Uh, and um, so the, the trick in tychography is they take signals in the Fourier plane and then they do f f um, phase retrieval on it, sure. right? So uh, I don't know if you know, there was a very nice paper by uh, Dimitri Psaltis uh, uh, from EPFL a couple of years ago now, uh, where uh, he, he, they, they built this system where uh, they, they get this, the light from the sample they look in the Fourier plane, and they make a hologram of it. So they've, so they've got now the phase information as yes, well as yes. the intensity of information. So once they know that, they know the modulus and phase, they can therefore uh, refocus that light digitally yes. and make a synthetic confocal. And they did this in this paper. It's very neat. And that, that shows a lot of the similarity between tychography and some and of these other techniques, I think. So it yeah. wouldn't beat that um, PSF resolution that you have shown the uh, semi-conic uh, area. It will be just inside that semi-conic area, the resolution. Uh, sorry, what, with uh, tychography? Uh, yeah, yes, yes. It I wouldn't think, be I think the in principle with tychography... Ah, yeah. So, um, again... Uh, yeah, yeah, I think you probably... You, could, you can do tychography with fluorescence, for example. I, 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 I can't see why you shouldn't do that. Can you? Uh, no, 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 no. The direction of the uh, illuminating light uh, in fluorescent is always the same. You cannot play with it. I don't think so. Can we? Uh, Can we have fluorescent no, dark not. field? Uh, no, you can't. Uh, that wouldn't work. Okay, so you're not going to get that f yeah. factor of two in fluorescent. Right. Right. Yeah. Thank so you. I think you're left with a missing cone, probably.
Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? I do. I, I, I might ask you a question then. So you, you seem to know about tychography. Do people do tychography in a reflection direction as well as in the forward direction? I was eager to be the first to do this. Okay. <laughs> yes, they do it. Yeah. I found a paper I could email you the paper. Yeah, okay. We can talk later. Okay. So, I think. Uh, yeah, there's one there. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, in confocal microscopy, as far as I know, uh, people uh, recommended that you overfill the objective uh, aperture by some factor uh, 1.2 or 1.4. Uh, I ask you uh, if, if we get better resolution if yeah. we overfill okay. and why? Basically, um, for true confocal, um, for true confocal with a very small pinhole, right? Uh, you effectively square the point spread function. So that means you double the bandwidth, but the point spread function uh, is only improved, uh, narrowed by a factor of the square root of two. Uh, it's because the transfer function, as well as being doubled in bandwidth, it also drops at the high frequencies to some degree. Uh, so, you know, so the different ways of measuring these things, you get a different degree of improvement. A bit confusing, first of all, but that, that's, we can talk more if you like later. <laughs> okay, I, now I'm going to uh, carry on then and talk about uh, 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 partially coherent imaging and phase contrast microscope. I'm, I'm obviously not going to get very far with this because I've been too slow. Uh, but I've also lost my cursor again. Where did it go? <laughs> uh. Oh dear. Sorry, I'm uh why, why is it what, what, what? Oops. Sorry, the last bit of time I've got, I now can't carry on. What am I doing? Ah, I think it's to do with this. Ah, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. I think it's because of the airport again. Right, so let's, um, oh, now I've found it. Right, okay. So, um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have to skip through some of this a bit quickly, and um, so I, I don't know quite, I think probably the more experimental parts and the instrumental parts are more interesting to you, that, to, to you than the theory. Um, right, now, yeah, so th this is worth saying. Uh, so, the, the, there are three main uh, methods of phase contrast, three main classes, let's call them. Uh, one is based on complex uh, pupil function. So, what I said is that if you've got a perfect system, you don't get phase contrast, right? So, you've got to mess up the system in some way. <coughs> one way is to improve, is to in introduce some complex uh, function to the, uh, to, to the pupil function. Uh, the second method is to uh, introduce an asymmetry in the system. Uh, and uh, the third group of methods are interference methods, where you actually have a reference beam. Uh, and uh, so now, interference methods, I'm not really going to say anything more about today. Uh, actually, because they normally come in another talk that I do. Um, but the... the um, so the, the, these, these coherent methods... Um, 
Basically, they do have some disadvantages. They also have some advantages. Uh, uh, so, for example, digital holographic microscope. Um, it's a coherent method, right? So uh, you don't get this um, improvement in resolution that you can get uh, in an ordinary microscope by using oblique illumination. Uh, and um, uh, so, so this is the advantage of using these partially coherent methods. Um, you avoid speckle as well. Uh, but the question is how to get the information out and make sense of it. Right, now, so this was this paper that I mentioned yesterday, but I didn't show. Uh, this is from uh, Hopkins, uh, 1953. Uh, well, this, is, this is where he develops the theory of partially coherent imaging in a microscope. Uh, and um, so these were the, where these, um, you remember I said about these spatial frequencies, M, N, P, and Q. Uh, and you see here he's got these summations. This is because it's a Fourier series, uh, because he's looking at a repetitive object. Uh, and um, so a very important paper, this one, I would have to say. Uh, and then um, in our paper, the, the paper I published with Chowdhury in 1977, uh, image formation in the scanning microscope. So what we wanted to do in this paper was to come up with the theory of confocal microscope and compare it with a conventional microscope. So we obviously had to treat the conventional one too. Uh, and, um, but we changed these periodic objects to non-periodic ones, and so all these things are, uh, you see that it, it's a, a Fourier transforms rather than the Fourier series. Uh, and we came up with the transfer functions for uh, the confocal as compared with the conventional system in this paper. Right, now, so uh, I mentioned this before as well, about how in a, in a uh, partially coherent system, you basically have to replace this, this, these two terms by this one. And this, um, this, this, this quantity, which is called the transmission cross coefficient, um, so here you notice I've put these two as zero. So M and P are both spatial frequencies in the x direction. Uh, and uh, so what, is, what does it mean? It means uh, th this is actually given by the product of three circles. Uh, this is the condenser lens, this is the objective lens, and this is the objective lens. Well, th this one is um, com complex conjugate of the condenser, condenser lens. So, the, uh, so this transmission cross coefficient is given by this area of overlap of, of now three circles, where one circle is, uh, might have a different radius. Uh, and if you calculate it uh, for this particular case where the c condenser aperture is the same as the objective aperture, this is what this thing looks like. Uh, sorry, so this thing, M1 and M2, are what I called M and P before. You see, uh, the cutoff is, is this funny head or shape. Uh, and um, so I had a student, Shalin Mehta, who did quite a lot of uh, work on trying to model these things. Uh, and, uh, oh, I'll come on to that in a minute. This is back to Chowdhury again. This is showing how the cutoff of these systems varies as you change uh, the value of this... Um, a coherence uh, ratio. Yeah, um, with Shalin, um, what, what, um, to simplify things, um, it turns out you can simplify things by introducing what we call central and difference coordinates. So we've got M1 and M2, and we look at the sums, um, M1 plus M2 and M1 minus M2, and similarly for distances. And if you introduce these new coordinates, uh, what it has, the effect it has, is to rotate this transmission cross coefficient so that it looks like this now. Uh, and uh, it turns out that this thing here, we can think of, uh, is, is got a lot of meaning in terms of um, uh, these uh, phase space type quantities like the Wigner distribution function. Uh, so this is the way we interpret the, 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 the meaning of this thing. Right, now, but... On the other hand, um, for most of what I'm going to say, th this partially coherent stuff is just too complicated to do. So we want to look at some special cases 
uh, which are simpler to think of. And it turns out there are two very important special cases that are much simpler. Uh, one is, uh, you see now I'm down to uh, um, just one quantity. Um, this is just in the x direction, but I'm also putting p equals zero. Uh, so this thing is what I call the weak object transfer function. This is going to be true. This is going to apply for a weak object. Uh, and um, so everything becomes much simpler if you look at weak objects. The other thing is this case, which I call the phase gradient transfer function, the PGTF, which is this quantity. It's where P equals M. Uh, and this applies uh, for an object which is, which is varying slowly in space. So this would apply, uh, actually, it turns out, this one would apply if the first Braun approximation is satisfied. This one would apply if the right of approximation is satisfied. Um, so, oh yeah, I'll sk skip this one. Uh, and, and skip this one. This is just deriving why this weak phase object works. Um, I'll skip this one as well. Let's go on to this. Um, weak object transfer function, you calculate that for different values of this uh, coherence ratio, uh, and it becomes complex. Uh, and you see, these are some examples. This is a very small aperture, condenser aperture, a very large condenser aperture. Uh, and you find uh, that um, what we want, what we want is for this imaginary part to have a nice smooth shape, because we can use this imaginary part to look at the uh, imaginary part of the object effectively, and therefore get the phase information. That's the idea. Uh, and, but we we find if you look at these curves, this becomes a nice shape. This becomes a nice shape. Um, but in this case here, eventually, this becomes very very weak. Eventually, if I put this as one, this, this would vanish. Uh, so if you choose a coherence ratio around 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, you can get a, an imaginary part which is quite strong and quite well behaved. Uh, and um, so um, what you might imagine doing then is taking two images. You defocus one way, you defocus the other way, uh, and subtract the two. And the idea then is that the, is, is that the ordinary bright field image would cancel out, and you'd just be left with the phase contrast part. Uh, and uh, with a transfer function given by these sorts of curves like that. So you see 0.6 is about optimum for this. Uh, and, uh, and then we notice, amazingly, uh, that, that th this region here, these are, these are all parabolas, basically. right? So digitally, we can get rid of that parabola by... Uh, applying an inverse Laplacian operator to the data, uh, which has the uh, effect of, of dividing by this parabola, and we end up getting something like this. So, so after we've applied this inverse Laplacian, uh, this is our transfer function for phase information that we get. And it, you see how it depends on the, the ratio, uh, contrast ratio S, coherence ratio. Uh, so uh, around 0 0.5, 0 0.7, around this region, you're getting a flat response, all works very nicely. Uh, so this is applying this method in, in, in uh, practice. Uh, and uh, so this is an example looking at an optical fiber. Uh, sorry, this, so this is the method I'm talking about. Uh, this is the weak object transfer function method. Uh, and you see we recover this parabolic shape of this refractive index very nicely. And this is applying it to some biological samples. These other ones are, are TIE, means transport of intensity equation. This is another method that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Uh, dark field microscope. Now, dark field microscope is not really phase contrast, but it's got a lot of similarity and does, in fact, does give some information from phase. Uh, and um, so dark field microscope, all you do is you put in a an annular mask in the illumina illumination side, and then an aperture stop so that the direct light doesn't get through. And, uh, well, this is just, like, okay, I'll go through, miss out this. This is what this, um, uh, this is what the uh, transmission cross coefficient looks like uh, for a dark field system. Uh, and uh, in particular, this is very funny, uh, that you don't get anything in this region here. 
the sum frequencies are not imaged. You, are, you only image the difference frequencies. So you, if, uh, what this is also meaning is that if you've got a single spatial frequency, you don't get an image. Uh, and um, so you only get complicated mixtures of spatial frequencies, uh, which is why the, the images are rather difficult to interpret. You, you very often get, for example, doublings of frequency. Um, but the Zernicke phase contrast method is very similar. Uh, so uh, the Zernicke phase contrast method, uh, we replace this aperture stop by a phase ring. So the, now all we do is we change the phase of the direct light relative to the other light. Uh, and uh, so it brings it into uh, view. Again, I'm not going to go through the maths. Uh, but this is basically how it's working. Uh, we've got this, we're trying, this is our phase information that we're trying to see. Uh, and um, you see that the, the point is we can't see this because effectively the length of this vector is the same as the length of that vector. So what you do in Zernicke phase contrast is you rotate that round until it's like this relative to the other. Uh, and now the, the, the change in length of this is much bigger and therefore you can see the phase contrast. So that's roughly how it works. This is what it does in terms of the um, transfer function. Uh, again, you'll see that it's got, this is, what, this is the phase contrast part, and these are sort of bits we don't want there, like artifacts on top. Um, I miss out that. Right, yeah, okay. Uh, um, I don't know, this, this has got displaced. This is talking about the focus, which I've already spoken about. Um, now I'm going to go on to transport of intensity equation. Yeah, so this is related to the defocus, uh, but it was shown, uh, you know, as light propagates, uh, it, this, this first seems very, very surprising, uh, but the, you can get the phase information by looking at the intensity of the light as it propagates. Uh, and uh, so this is what's called the transport of equation of intensity. It says uh, that the the IDZ, right, so the, the change in intensity with, along the axis gives you information about the phase of the object, or phase of the wave flow. Uh, and uh, so if you can measure this, uh, measure this, you can actually recover that. Uh, so this, um, this was, um, this equation, uh, well, in, in this form, it's first derived by Teague, but it's very close to the iconal equation, which is much, much older. Uh, and, um, yeah, and if you expand this divergence, you can write it like this. Uh, often this second term is small, and we can forget about it. Uh, and then we're just left with a Laplacian-type term. Um, this was um, uh, a nice picture taken by um, Miguel Porras. Is, uh, you know Miguel Poros, uh, who was visiting me, and, and um, we were talking about transport of intensity equation, and this was uh, just such a beautiful scene to see it. But you look at the pattern on this boat. You see these, this is the sun shining on the water, and you see these patterns here. Um, so what, this, what, what the, I wanted to show from this is that you see intensity changes as a result of the changes in height of the water. So if you think of the water as being like a wave, uh, it's like converting a phase information to an intensity information, right? So this is exactly what we try to do in, in transport of intensity equation, using the, the transport of intensity equation, is, is to start off from this information and recover the shape of the, of the surface of the water that's producing this shape. Right, see, these are some examples. Um, the first experimental ones, I think, were done by Norbert Streibel, 1984. This is an, an example he gave. Uh, but he didn't do the full reconstruction. As far as I know, the first reconstructions were done uh, by uh, the group of Keith Nugent. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so this is an example where they've recovered the phase of a cheek cell uh, using this method. Um, now, in order to do this reconstruction, normally we have to measure the intensity in three planes, which takes some time. 
Uh, we had a project when I was in Singapore uh, where we came up with a way of doing this with just a single shot using color. Uh, and uh, so you use a, you use a, ca a, uh, a uh, color camera. Uh, you pick up three images. The three colors are used for the three planes. And then you can get images uh, of phase information from this, or just from this information. It, of course, is assuming that the, uh, the object is achromatic, right? So if the object is going to do different things for different colors, it wouldn't work. Right, uh, okay, so TIE, yeah, I, the main thing I wanted to uh, point out here that there's, you know, the way the phase that we measure is related to the object in a partially coherent system is very complicated. Uh, and uh, so don't think that you're actually measuring the phase of the object directly, you're not. Uh, and uh, the other thing is that, um, is that um, it doesn't seem to work too well with three dimensional objects. You can't, you can't image three-dimensional phase variations uh, in your sample, phase refractive index variations in your sample using this method. This is another method I wanted to talk about, though. Um, so this is um, again, got quite a long history. Uh, and we did a lot on this when I was in Oxford uh, in the scanning type system. You illuminate your sample with a spot of light, just like we do in Confocal. Uh, but you look in the back focal plane where you do tychography and you place here a split detector and you take two signals. So this is a sort of like a, almost like tychography in a way, except it's just got two elements. Uh, and we subtract these and that gives you an information about the phase gradient of the sample. Uh, I think, uh, oh no, uh, yeah, so this is an example. This is a cheek cell. So you just subtract this signal from this one and you get this beautiful image um, of, uh, of the phase information. Uh, this is, you can do it in reflection as well. This is looking at an integrated circuit. Oh yeah, this is um, pointing out, this method is actually very, very sensitive. Um, this is an image uh, of a single monolayer on a substrate. So it's, it's one of these langmuir blodgett films. So it's only a few nanometers thick, but we can detect it using this method. Uh, this is what this um, phase gradient transfer function looks like. This is what basically measures the is a, uh, transfer function for these slow spatial frequencies. Uh, oh, yeah, we also found that you can modify this system by changing the geometry of the detector. So we made it, for example, an annular split detector. Uh, and then you can get these nice images that look like these ones, uh, showing up different um, properties of the sample, basically. Yeah, and then, um, so that was all back when I was in Oxford. And then a lot, lot later, uh, my student, Shalin Mater again, uh, he, he said, well, why don't we do this in an ordinary microscope? Uh, and um, so, so he did some experiments on this. So the, the idea is you need to replace or you return all the rays the opposite way. You need this source here. Of course, you can't have a negative source. So what you have to do is you take one image, you take another image, and you subtract this one from this one. Uh, and he called this um, asymmetric illumination uh, differential phase contrast. Uh, and, uh, and of course, if you want to do this d phi dx and d phi dy, uh, you need to have, um, you, you, you need four images in order to do the differentiation in the two directions. And he did lots of experiments on this, uh, and uh, so getting images from uh, biological samples and so on. Uh, and uh, yeah, and then we came up with um, this problem of if you know what d phi dx is, you know what d phi dy is, what is phi? How can you solve that? Uh, and well, uh, the simplest thing you might think of doing is just you starting from this and integrating to get phi. But the trouble is that doesn't work. Because if you do that, you've got this constant of integration. And you don't know what the constant of integration is. The constant of integration varies in y. Uh, so we came up with a method where we can 
combine the, these informations in X and Y, uh, and this was basically our algorithm. I'll leave you to think about that, or someone, if you are interested, you can come and talk to me more about it. Uh, and, um, but it seems to work very well to do this. So this is an example uh, of, uh, of some cells. Uh, and uh, so defy the X, defy the Y, and then we recover the phase. Um, now, so DPC has been around quite a long time. It was first invented for electron microscope. I think the first paper was this one by Deckers and DeLang. Uh, and then uh, for the optical case, there was a paper by Stewart. This was actually just an abstract. It was a paper at a conference. Uh, and, uh, and a pattern was taken out by Ellis. Uh, and we didn't know about these, actually, when we published our paper in 1984. Uh, and then the, the, uh, the final method I was going to talk about is Namaski. I see I'm supposed to stop, so I'll be very quick just to show something about that. Namaski, you, you probably know, is a very standard method now which uses Wollaston prisms uh, to split the light. So it's basically a shearing interferometer. Uh, and um, uh, let's shift that. I'll miss that out. Um, yeah, this is pointing out one of the disadvantages of Namaski is you sometimes get out, uh, artifacts caused by birefringence in the sample because it's based on polarization. So these are regions which are birefringent, uh, which show up uh, um, in, in the DIC image as a phase, but they're not really a phase. I'll skip that. I'll skip that. I'll skip that. I'll skip that. Uh, yeah, again, uh, you can, again, you can, ah, this is um, another sort of approach. Um, this DIC is effectively an interferometer, right? Uh, and so you can do an e effectively the same as phase stepping that you do in normal interferometry. You take three or four images and do some processing on those, uh, and you can get rid of the nonlinearities in the, uh, the original DIC image. So that's a very neat approach. Uh, and uh, so you can get a measurement of, of, um, of the phase gradient, which again, then you've got to uh, recover the phase from that. Uh, th this is actually demonstrating what happens if you try just integrating this thing. You see you get all this streaking. This is from the constant of integration. Um, so, uh, but, uh, but you can, uh, yeah, so, oh, this was um, a neat thing we were doing when I was in Singapore. So this is showing this phase-stepping DIC and getting a phase-gradient image. And this is the final phase. Um, we found uh, that you can actually use transport of intensity on the DIC images, which was a bit of a surprise to us, first of all, but it seems to work very well. Uh, and this led to a rather uh, amazing experiment we did where we did both on the same sample. Uh, so we've got this sample. We take four images and we do, and we do this phase-shifting DIC on it and get this image. And we take three defo defocus measurements and we do TIE on it, transport of intensity equation, and we recover the phase and we get this image. Uh, so these are two reconstructions uh, of the same object performed actually on different data because they're on these three and on these four. But you see amazingly good uh, similarity between those two reconstructions. And this is showing uh, getting quantitative uh, phase information, again looking at optical fiber, seeing this parabolic phase structure. Okay, I think this is the very last slide of this. I've, I've gone through this very quickly, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, but this is just comparing these different methods and what their advantages and disadvantages are. Uh, and uh, I guess I could just sum up to say that no method has all advantages and no disadvantages. So you have to pick the method according to what you want to do, I guess. So I'll stop at that point. Uh, if anyone wants to ask something, I don't know whether we ought to Very rush. Very short or. question, if there is. Uh, no. 
Please. I'm sorry, I, want, I will keep it very short. Now, I don't know if it's a stupid question. Uh, this year, I ha was in a presentation by Professor Gerd Hausler from Germany. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, perhaps you know him. Yeah, I know uh, him he well. talked about that when we want to see the details of an image in our computer, we better get the derivative of the image in two directions or one direction first and then see. And then he proved his uh, claim by showing the FFTs of the two images. The, the image itself has an FFT, for example, with a, a cluster of this size. And the derivative has a cluster much twice as big. So um, am I wrong, or is that just an illusion of improving the details? It's not really improving yeah, the details. Yeah, yeah. I think um, one thing you might have noticed in some of the pictures I showed, that actually, if you look at the phase gradient, it, you, you see a lot more by eye than if by you eye. look at the phase. Yeah. Uh, because, um, you know, I guess differentiation is going to boost the highest frequencies because it multiplies by a ramp. Uh, and um, so there was a very recent paper by, uh, by my, uh, another of my former students, Kieran Larkin, uh, about this, about, about um, uh, visualizing DIC images. You might like to look at that paper. It's quite neat. Uh, but I, I think it's because of this effect that you're boosting up the high frequencies. Just to the eye, not in fact the resolution, just to the eye. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly what Gert said, but uh, I haven't... I don't know, he, did, he didn't say anything more. Yeah. It wasn't wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. So, um, it's a little bit late, but Professor Colin Shepard is with us all this period. So, please, if you have questions, uh, you can ask for him. Yeah, please come and talk with me. Okay. Uh, I always like people right. talking to me. And uh, now I have to uh, remind you the aspects uh, uh, for the experimental part. So be careful again. Groups uh, four, five, six at two o'clock in Adriatico. Good. So better take the lunch there to be in time. Second, uh, one two, three groups in multidisciplinary lab. They are two hands-on experiments written in the program and is an additional part with uh, AB diffraction and for uh, UV um, experiment, uh, they are half of two groups to increase the efficiency of the process. For additional things, ask Umberto because he will explain. And please, about the poster session, it will start at four o'clock. Uh, be sure that you will place the posters in the hall before leaving for experimental part during the lunchtime. And groups four, five, six, please come by walk. 10 minutes before four to be here for poster session. And the last one thing, prepare 10 minutes discussion for the evaluator because we have a lot of things to do and we have to speed up the things. And now Umberto will give you some new details. Thank you. Please, uh, 10 minutes before two here in the lobby. This uh, poster, that are still, uh, they will be printed before four. And then you can come here, Federica will bring here this poster before four. Come here and collect there in the table. And then you can add there in the, in the poster station, okay?